So, you want to know the best way to get into Japan? Well, there's a little thing that I've got called a working holiday visa. I've spent the last few months researching, planning and finally moving to Japan with this special visa. It gives you unrestricted access to the whole country for one year with a few little stipulations, but there's a lot that goes into getting one. So, on this video today, I'm going to go over actually too much information about everything I did in order to get it, so if you have any questions about the process, hopefully this video helps you out. And I want to emphasize, this is all my own research, I'm not a lawyer, this isn't legal advice. Make sure that this video is a part of your research, but never the be all and end all. I don't want to be responsible if something goes wrong, because this is just what I did. And of course I'm British, so I'm going to talk specifically about the United Kingdom working holiday visa for Japan. This information will apply to a lot of different types of working holiday visas, but just to be safe, remember that things might be a bit different. So yeah, bear in mind, whenever I say this is what it is, I mean, this is what the English one that I did is. Some things are going to change. And without further ado, let's get into it. So what is the working holiday visa? A working holiday visa lets anyone under the age of 30 from the United Kingdom visit for a year to do work and holidaying. It says as long as holidaying is your primary purpose of visit. They don't want you coming to work five days a week on this. This gives you residence beyond just being a tourist, which means you can sign up for things like the National Health Service if you want, pension programs if, if you want, and you get a residence card, which means you can sign up for a bank and so on and so on. Proper Japanese citizen on this. It's not just for tourism. And I will say while this program's open to many countries, if you're in America watching, sorry, there isn't an agreement between Japan and America for this. So you're gonna have to find another way to get into Japan. You can still watch if you're interested. Spaces are also limited. The United Kingdom gives out a thousand of these a year and this goes from the Japanese tax year of April to March. So if you wanna make sure your plans aren't ruined, make sure that you're there early because if you wait until August, maybe they've already gone depending on the year. For me, there was no issue, but again, plan. So now you know what it is, you need to decide what you want to do there. This might sound obvious, but it's gonna affect everything else we're doing here. Do you just really wanna travel to Japan for a year? Do you wanna go and see a few cities? Do you wanna work at a language school for a whole year and happen to go to some concerts or something? My personal plan was to travel for the whole year and as you'll see, there's a few things that have come out of this that we're gonna get into. Eligibility. So there are eight official guidelines that you need to meet in order to get this visa. There are some extra ones that are not guidelines, but also guidelines that we'll go on to. For the UK, here are the eight guidelines and a little bit about each of them. Number one, valid UK passport. Mostly straightforward, but if you haven't been abroad in 10 years and you don't have one, you'll need to renew yours before starting this process. And that takes anywhere from weeks to months. Number two, application form. It's fairly straightforward other than the fact that there's a lot of things it's asking for that you might not have, and that's okay. If you have a guarantor or an inviter, add one, but I didn't, and I left them blank, and I confirmed this with the embassy, and they said that's okay. It also seems some sections are fine to put your best guess as well. I personally didn't want to book a hotel or flights until my visa was approved, but I looked up where I'd like to stay and put that information, and that seemed to be okay. I did end up staying there. There is a handy guide on the website that goes through what each slot needs to have filled in, so I'm not going to go into any more detail than that. Three, your passport size photograph taken within the last six months. Now this is important because my passport was over six months old, so I couldn't reuse those photos. Because if they look at your passport and they look at the photo and they're the same, they might cause an issue with it and you don't want to have any last minute surprises. So you're going to need to go to wherever you want to get your passport photos taken and get some new ones, unless it happened to be within the last six months. You got your passport, then lucky you, I guess. And this isn't what's going to be on your residence card that gets taken at the airport after you've had a 22 hour flight. So mine looks awful. Um, <laughs> but don't worry about what the photo is. It's just for your application. Your CV, you attach your CV. I'm not writing a video on how to produce one of these. So mine was fine. Outline of intended activities. Say what you plan to do. This was mine, and I'll note that there's one thing that they do want you to say in here, is they want you to say month by month what you're going to do. I initially said month one, month two, no, they wanted you to say in January I will do this, in February I will do this, but just go for your vague ideas. As you can see, I had a very travel heavy itinerary, but if you just said I want to go and work in a language school two days a week in Tokyo and explore on the other five days, you know, they're not going to mind too much as long as they know what you're doing each month. And this isn't set in stone, my plan has already changed drastically from this and no one's going to chase me up on it. At least I hope so. It's intended activities, it's not set in stone. Number six, a written reason for applying for the visa. Now this might have some overlap with step five, but it's actually quite different. This is saying why you want the visa in the first place. What is it about Japan that makes you want to live there for a year? Is it the culture, is it the food? Just tell them why you're making this life-changing decision. If you've got this far, you probably have a good reason for it. Here's mine for reference again. Use it as a basis if you like. 
cleared funds, you need to have either £2,500 in your bank account or £1,500 plus flights already booked. They want to know that at least until you have the chance to get a job in Japan, you can support yourself. For this, you just need to bring three months bank statement showing that you just had this money. So if you've got no money in your bank account and you're just going to put in two and a half grand instantly, that might not fly with them. I had this money saved up because I've been planning this for years. But bear it in mind, if you don't have two and a half grand in your bank account now, that means one of two things. One, if you don't have that money, obviously you need to save up for it. This is a requirement for the visa. Number two, if you have it, but it's not in your bank account, maybe it's across several other banks or maybe it's under your bed, then you need to get it in one bank account and sit on it for three months. So that's gonna take a while if you don't have it ready. And number eight, the certificate for completion of registration. This may disappear in the future. I think this is only gonna be on here while the country is still closed for COVID. But right now it is essential and the hardest thing to get in my opinion. Now this is a stickler because it's something you can't get yourself. Essentially what this form is saying is that a Japanese company says on their heads be it that you will obey the COVID restrictions in place. As it happens to the UK there aren't a lot of those because there's no quarantine now but it still needs to be done. And yeah, you're not gonna be able to just ask Family Mart for this, they're not gonna give it to you. So you need a company that specifically has a reason to do this. And there's two main places you're gonna get this. The first is to get a job, which is kind of what the visa is intending you to do. If you get yourself a part-time job, like maybe a language learning class in Tokyo, or I've heard that there's places in Okinawa that do like three month trips, then that's gonna cover you. They'll give you this form, you can present that, that's fine. But then you're obviously going to be locked into whatever their contract says ahead of time, which you may want, you may want that extra boost of income, but you may not want to be starting work as soon as you get into Japan. You might want to explore a bit. That's definitely where I was. So then we come into option two. Option two is that we're basically just going to pay a company for this. But of course, we can't just pay a company for this. Like, that sounds dodgy. So instead, there are two companies I'm aware of that provide services that will also provide you with this as like an add-on. It may be the main reason you want their services, but that's not like the advertised product. Number one is World Unite, which is a company that helps people from all around the world with working holiday visas to all around the world. So if you want help with your working holiday visa in terms of finding work, early accommodation, setting up a bank account, help out with all the forms, ask them any questions you might have. They provide a service for that. I'm not sponsored. Last I checked, this service was about 800 British pounds, which is quite pricey. The second one is that some language schools offer this service as well. If you were to book some amount of language school periods, for the example, I'm going to use Koto Academy. If you book their intensive five day a week course, they will give you this form. Now, this was about £600 a month and it comes with 60 hours of language lessons. Now, this is the one I went for. I thought having language lessons for a month before going to fully explore Japan would be a great choice. And it turns out it was. I've used a lot of the language I've learned there in my everyday to day life. Well, mostly sumimasen and things like that but i have had the odd conversation with japanese people and it's been useful but if you're not looking to get a job before you arrive one of these two options is probably the one you need to look into both quite pricey but whichever service offers the best value for money for you is up to you all your documents are in place okay great it's time to go down to the embassy first book an appointment online to go down to the embassy and yes you do need to do this in person at either london or Edinburgh for the UK. You cannot do this online. So if you're like me and you're in the middle of the country, this was a 60 pound return trip there and back. Oh, and when I said it's 60 pound there and back, you need to go to the embassy twice, once to apply and once to get your results. So 120 pounds just to make the application. Oh, and you need to bring your passport to the embassy because to get your visa, they put that on your passport. So you have to leave that with them for a week. So if you're planning any holidays, make sure it's not in between this waiting period because you're not gonna be able to use your passport. Make note of your application number for your online form because you will need to present this so you will not be allowed into the embassy. Once inside, you take a ticket, sit down and wait for your number to be called. Once it is, you approach the booth, give them your information and they'll look over it. When they look over it, they'll just have a quick glance to make sure it's all as they expect. For example, as I said earlier, they pointed out that I needed to say the months and not just month one, month two. So they'll help you with a few things that might be obviously wrong that you can fix right then and there. After they've done this, they'll give you a receipt that you must keep safe. It's uh, an A4 sheet, so I'd recommend bringing a plastic wallet with you to put it in and make sure your backpack can keep that nice and flat. And then you can come back on the date that it says. This will typically be one week in advance of whenever you arrive, but check the date because this could change. And that's it. You just come back in a week. Now, I was expecting two things to be different here. The first is I was just kind of expecting some kind of interview based on what we've written, going over your questions. But no, there was none of this. They just look over your documents and that's it. And the second was I thought there might be a standalone room which kind of goes alongside this. But no, it's just booths like you might see in an American DMV on TV. You just walk up to the booth. 
they'll process your request and you can leave, which makes it, I think, a bit less stressful than I was imagining. So if you are worried about it, don't worry. It's just giving them your forms. I'll also note that I missed one vital thing in my application, that I gave them one of the wrong forms because it was outdated, and they phoned me up about it to fix it. Now, I was in the pouring down rain in the middle of London at this point, um, too far away to get to the embassy, so I rushed into the closest museum to have a roof over my head five minutes before it closed and was frantically on my phone, emailing, trying to get this document to them, and I managed to do it with minutes to spare. And I found them and said, have you got it? Is that the right one? They said yes. So although you need to go down to apply, some things seem to be able to be fixed via email, but they cannot give you the result via email. You have to wait a week and then come back. On your second day, remember to pack your receipt and £20 cash. They want to get you used to Japan early, no credit cards or anything expected, just paper money. Or £20 coins, I guess, but don't do that. And I will say, generally you can go back one week afterwards, but they're not going to chase you up on this. I actually waited two weeks, I was kind of expecting to tell you when it's ready, but no, whenever your receipt tells you you can go, you can go. So you don't need to wait as long as I did. When it says you can go, it'll be ready. Go and go for it. Now, when you arrive, hopefully you get accepted, then they'll give you your passport back, you'll get your visa in there, and you're ready to start doing everything else. So now you've got your visa, congratulations, you can now start planning, and that means we're only about a quarter of the way there. Yeah, there's a lot you have to plan. Firstly, your job, assuming you have one. A lot of the things in this preparation list are not going to apply if you're, say, fresh out of university and moving out of your dorms or your parents' house or something. So bear that in mind. But if you do have a job, you're going to need to consider the notice period, if you have to leave, if they're going to let you work remotely, they might need to sort some things out there as well. So just bear in mind that at worst case scenario, you might have to work your notice. I didn't have to work my whole notice, luckily. Make sure you've got this sorted so you're not delaying your trip for months. Your house, if you're renting, that's going to have a notice period as well. If you've got a mortgage, you're going to have to do something with it, potentially rent it out. You probably don't want to sell it because the working holiday visa only lasts a year and it's very hard to renew. So you've got to do something with wherever you're living and that could take time as well. So there's a lot of different cogs that have all got to fall right into place to make this work. And of course, it's not just the house itself. You've got your builds to cancel. Some of these, you might have contracts. You might have an internet contract that you've got to pay out. Personally, when I moved into my house, I knew I was planning to leave to go to Japan as soon as I could. So I got a non-rolling contract. But bear in mind, these could be some additional costs if you need to cancel halfway through. Flights. Now you know the dates that you can enter, you can finally book. It's exciting. You could have done this beforehand and you might have done if you wanted to get that £1,500 threshold, but I wanted to wait until after it was approved. Direct flights do one from London, but, but from the north you can get connections. I personally flew with Etihad Airways and it was actually a lovely flight. It's the first time I've flown outside of Europe in a long time and it's actually one of the best flights I've been on if you ignore the two hour delay at Manchester, but that's entirely our Brit's fault. I do remember particularly they were walking around with drinks and I was like, oh, is it free? And they kind of just gave me a look like, yes, we're not some kind of lower class airline. It's complimentary, so I enjoyed that. We had in particular have a policy where you can change your flight dates once. I booked out as far along as I could, which was April 2023, and then closer to the time I'll be able to rebook those flights for a full year. So bear this in mind, you might want to see if the airline you're going for has a policy like this, or if you only need to book one way. Now, you might also want to go onto the customs website and fill out the details here, I'll put the link in the description, but I'll note that nowhere along any of the visa process or anywhere online did I find this information. It was only my particular share house that I was staying with that told me this, so I don't know if it was required, but you're better safe than sorry to fill out as much things as possible. No one ever asked me for this at any point, but yeah. Medication. Have you got any special medication requirements? Well, first, check they're legal in Japan, because even some common medicines in the West aren't legal in Japan. I'm asthmatic, and the only things I needed to bring with me was inhalers, but you can only bring a one month supply without special permission. You need to fill out a form, get this approved, and present it to the customs officials when you arrive. Now this actual form and who you have to apply it to depends on which airport you're landing at. Narita is the most common and the one I apply to, so I'll put the link for that down there. But if you're not landing at Narita, make sure you look into where you can get your medication through customs. Mobile data. Chances are you're going to want internet while you're in Japan and your current provider probably doesn't have a great offer for Japan. So you're going to need to cancel your contract, whatever it is in the UK. Hopefully it's a short one. I again had a one month cancellation policy because I knew I was leaving soon and then book something in Japan. Now, you can either wait until you get here, but then you'll be a bit scuffed if anything happens at the airport. There are some places you can get while you're still in the UK though. Personally, I went with Sakura Mobile, which I've heard is pretty expensive. It's about £25 a month for 25 gigs of data, which isn't the best, but they do offer English support. And I kind of feel like having mobile data on my phone is so important just for getting around. If you get lost, if you're looking for a good restaurant, that it's worth paying a little bit extra to just know that if anything goes wrong, you can get support without needing to be fluent in Japanese, because I am not. Even if you only do this initially for your first month and then look for a better deal once you're in here, it's kind of worth just having that security. But there are other options if you don't want to spend that much money. 
I don't know much about them, but there's comparison websites online and Google Translate exists, so there's my recommendation. Number six, accommodation. You'll need to book somewhere to stay, and there's some little asterisks that come alongside this that I'll get into later in the video. But for the first point, you just need somewhere to stay when you land, whether you want to have a hotel to stay in for two weeks while you look for a place, or if you want to go straight into a share house or even anywhere else. That's up to you depending on what your plans are. So I'd recommend for at least the first week you have something booked out in advance, even if you're planning to land and then go and look at houses pretty sharpish. Make sure you've got that sorted. I booked a share house for thy foot, but I booked a share house for my first month and I was pretty happy with that decision. Number seven, get physical cash. You'll need lots of it. Japan is still a cash-based society in more ways than you might think. Some shops only accept cash, some accept card, but, but basically nowhere does contactless. I've managed to do it once in my entire stay here so far. It's up to you how much you want to carry with you, as you will be able to find ATMs where you can withdraw from foreign cards, but they might charge you a fee. I haven't done this yet, but I've heard that, say, 7-Eleven cash outs are quite reasonable. And of course, you may be charged by your own bank for a currency conversion fee. I'm lucky that, because I've got an old credit card with my bank, they don't do this, but just check what you have or if there's anything you can apply for before you leave. And it's not just shops that only accept cash, cash has multiple other uses as well. For example, I wanted to buy some concert tickets, but they don't accept Western bank cards. But what you can do is take your money into a physical convenience store and pay for it that way. The same applies for Disneyland tickets and even for topping up apps on your phone. There's an app that you can use to pay for things on your phone, but you need to deposit money in it either via a Japanese bank account or putting money in at a convenience store. So even if you're planning to not use that much physical cash somehow, you still need cash more than you're going to think you do. It's convoluted, but point is cash is useful. Number eight by now, packing. You're going away for a whole year and you need to make sure you can pack to account for that. And depending on your airline, who knows how much space you're going to get. If you're just planning to stay in one spot for a whole year, you probably don't need to worry too much as you can send some bags with you to arrive a few weeks after you arrive via the mail. But for someone like me who's traveling the whole year, you need to carry everything you can take and I can't physically carry 10 boxes on every train I go on, that's just unfeasible. So when I was planning for my travel, I was allowed three items. A big suitcase to go in the airplane, a backpack and a personal item which I bought a laptop bag. These three items made everything I could carry for the whole year, and that's through summer, through winter, for my hobbies, for just living, I need to get a new laptop. Planning for this and seeing what you're gonna need for a whole year can make space quite tight. I've got a winter coat I'm not gonna use for several months that I'm just lugging around, and also quite expensive. For example, I used a desktop PC beforehand, and I wanted to get a laptop so I could do anything while I was here when I was at home. And of course, anything you aren't packing, you need a plan for as well. So whether that's gonna be, you're gonna store it in a storage unit, you're gonna ask your parents to store it like I did, or you're just gonna sell it. I tried to sell as much as I physically could that I knew I wasn't gonna need ahead of this just to minimize that damage. So basically you need to plan what you're gonna do with every single object you own, and that's kind of a lot. Number nine, get health slash travel insurance. Now, because you're gonna be an actual citizen in Japan, you can opt into the health insurance here, which I've done. The payments you make are based on your previous year's income in Japan. If this is your first time in Japan, it's gonna be about 15 pounds a month as it was for me, and that's worth going for. If you've worked here before, example, maybe you've got worked as an Aikaiwa before and then you're coming back, I don't know how much that's going to cost you, sorry. But even if you are planning to opt into this, you need to get travel insurance at least for your few weeks before you get the health insurance card through. And personally, I've just gone for the whole year just, just to be safe and to be sure if anything goes wrong, you know that you're covered. Number 10. And now, yes, we're at number 10 of things you need to plan. You need to book your COVID test. You may not need to do this in the future, but currently within 72 hours of your flight, you need to have a COVID test that needs to come back negative. And I don't know if this rule's changed because I saw varying sources of information online, but you want to have it done in the official Japanese way, which there's a link to that in the description, just so that you know that you've got the format that they're going to want and they're going to accept. Not everywhere's going to do this. I spoke to the place I was going to and made sure they do this format, I booked with them. Once you've got your test results, there's something you should do with them to make your life a whole lot easier. Which comes on to useful apps. Now, there's a ton of apps I could recommend, but I'm going to stick to three essential apps you shouldn't live without in Japan. The first is the My SOS app, which you're not going to use as soon as you get into Japan, but it's going to make your time at the airport a whole lot easier. Basically, this app's gonna ask you for a whole bunch of information, such as your COVID details, where you've traveled to recently, all these sorts of things. The app will go through it and it's in English. But basically, what you want is a blue or green screen on the app. Once you've got that, which is only gonna happen once you put your negative COVID test result in, then when you get to the airport, it makes your experience a whole lot quicker. You basically just walk through, but make sure you've got this sorted before you take off. 
The second two I would suggest are both Google All Stars. The Google Translate app is essential, not just for figuring out if you need to ask a certain question, but there's a mode where you can turn on your camera and point it at some Japanese text and it will translate into English for you. And by God, I use this every single day. If you want to know what a sign says, if you see a warning message, you want to make sure you're not doing anything you're not supposed to. If you want to know how many minutes to cook your noodles for, you just point it at it and it's going to help you with that translation, which this is literally just the most important app I've used in Japan. The second is Google Maps, because if you put in where you need to go somewhere, it will give you the best transport route to get there, wherever you want to walk, wherever you want to get buses, wherever you want to get trains. And it's very helpful when you're navigating, say, a complex tube system like Tokyo, that you don't need to go on any Japanese apps to have this. Google's got you covered. And what's more, it actually suggests the best carriage to get on if you've got a transfer it says oh get on on carriage four because that's closest to where the exits are so you'll transfer a bit quicker it's really quite impressive and i would recommend using this to get around it also has things like bus routes for example when i visited kyoto the subway there is not great but it's going to tell you which buses you need to get on and i remember once i was in a real hurry and i just looked up where's the closest bus from me here we go sorted oh as a bonus download links it's the main social media messaging app for people here but if you do get to speaking to anyone and you want to add them on something lines probably going to be what they have okay preparation done but we're not done oh no we've still got things to do even if we've prepared everything because once we get to japan we have to do some things requirements in japan we're finally done with the preparations but we're not done once you get in Japan, you still have several steps to take care of so you don't get literally deported. The first to bear in mind is a visa restriction. You can't work in places that affect public morals. This is deliberately vague, I guess, so they can encompass and decide what that means. But the examples they give is basically you don't want to work in any way dealing with alcohol, whether that be a nightclub, whether that be a bar. Apparently, that's off limits. So if you were thinking of getting a job in a bar to tide you over, that's one thing this visa bans. It's a very flexible visa, but it doesn't let you do literally everything. And the final necessity is a visit to your local city hall for three separate things. Set aside at least three hours for this and expect most of it to be waiting around. So bring something to do like a book or have something on your phone to do that isn't just social media. Oh, and they only open nine to five on weekdays. So if you have got a busy schedule or a busy job, it can be a bit difficult, but it is essential you do this. Firstly, I'm just gonna quote this directly. Within 14 days of moving into an address in Japan, working holiday participants must apply for resident registration at a local government office near to where they are living. Now there's a lot of different things in there and it's not super clear and this was something I struggled with. In addition, if you do not do this within 90 days of landing, you may be deported from the country. So this is essential to get sorted. But if you want to travel like me, this is actually quite problematic. There's a few different ways to tackle this though. And bear in mind, there's limited information to this that I could find on the English internet. So take this with a massive pinch of salt. This is just what I've found. Make sure you research this extra hard yourself. So the first option I saw online is to travel for 89 days and then on your 90th day, find a fixed address, whether that's a regular one or a share house, and then stay there. That's gonna be the simplest way to approach this within the rules. And it just means you can't travel as freely as you might like. But if you can get all your traveling done in 90 days, maybe that's what you wanna go for. My initial plan was that I was gonna move into a share house, which is an address you can register, and then try and move out and just see what happens, which I did. I went there, I moved out. I said, I've got a move out address, but I've not got anywhere I can move into. And basically, after like an hour of just like back and forth and asking different people, they said, this, we can't do this. They can't, they physically cannot register this, which is problematic. You're moving out, but if you don't know anywhere to move into, they said if you go and travel for a few weeks and then register it later, that's fine. But if you don't have anywhere you're going to go, if you're saying, my initial plan was to live in the share house for a month and then just go to different Airbnbs for a year, that doesn't work. So if you want to do that, I hit a dead end on that line. But I did have the third option, which I'm very glad to have, is that they said you can register a friend's address for this and as long as they're able to give you your mail um however that may be which mine can then that's okay you can have a friend or family member in japan's address registered for this and then you can do whatever you like as long as there's a physical place which is like this is where the entity known as raza zero can receive mail so if you have a friend for this it makes it a lot easier if you don't have friend or family in japan and you want to travel for a whole year on a working holiday visa suddenly i don't have an answer for you because I, this is what I wanted to do. This is what I tried. I wanted to just do it myself. But the Japanese system for a working holiday doesn't support holidays all that well. Which is weird. But that's how it is. So take that with a massive dollop of salt, I guess. 
And we're not done once you've done through all that charade because there's health insurance as well, which I went into a bit earlier, but you need to go and register for this at City Hall as well. And if you move, you need to go and register and deregister and all that. In the ward office I went to in Tokyo, after you get your address signed up, they give you a number, you can go upstairs, you queue up again, you can register for that. The way that health insurance really works in Japan, briefly, is that you pay your £15 a month and if you do need to go and see the doctor or anything, that covers 70% of the bill. You'll still need to foot the other 30%. But for £15 a month, I think that's a good enough offer to go into just in case something unfortunate happens. Finally, Japanese residents, where you want a Japanese resident if you want a working holiday visa, need to enroll in the pension scheme. This involves paying about 10,000 yen, 60, 70 quid a month to the pensions company, which if you're here for only a year, you're not going to make any use of that. When you leave the country, you can claim this back, but it's just the whole rigmarole process. But I did find out online that you can opt out for one year of payments. So if you're staying for one year like I am, and you can opt out for one year, it kind of just works out. Now, when I went to apply for this, the person I spoke to after me going through this with them, they happened to speak English, which was lucky. It was like, do you actually need this? No, I don't need this. This is a waste of both our times. But as far as your government is telling me, I need to do this. So we both kind of just shrugged and went through it and I applied for the pension and cancelled the pension payments. So it kind of comes around to nothing. I've heard of people just skipping this step, but I wanted to do things by the book. So that's where I'm at. And after all of those minutes, that is everything on my 3000 word script that I can imagine that you need to do on a working holiday visa before coming to Japan. Well, unless you want a bank account, or you need a job, or you need to figure out how to pay your taxes. But those are things that I don't have to worry about until later. So if you've made it this far, thank you so much for watching. And more than that, I hope this video has been helpful to you. If you've got any questions about anything that I've said, or things I've not covered that you think I might know, leave them in the comments below, and I'll see if I can figure them out. And obviously, if you're going for this, you're probably planning on coming here. So enjoy your time in Japan. And, well, feel free to have a look at the other videos on the channel. I make a ton of Japan videos that you might be interested in if you've sat through this. So, give them a look. But most of all, take care of yourself. Until next time.